Institutionally suspect restrictions were still in place some 10 plus months later, when the 2021 Nevada legislature convened on February 1, 2021. What this meant was, only lawmakers, their staffers, certain journalists, and legislative council bureau personnel were permitted to enter Nevada's legislative building, our state's ostensible House of the People, all other interested parties, including professional lobbyists and citizen activists alike, would not be permitted any entry into the legislative building until mid-April, well beyond the midpoint of the biennial 120-day session. Even then, when restrictions were partially lifted, the legislature allowed only for very limited public access, requiring 24 hours advance notice, plus proof of COVID vaccination or an on-site negative COVID test for entry into the building. Such was the intolerable status quo until the session's final days, when restrictions were again eased to allow for slightly more public engagement as vaccination rates rose. Whereas an accountable and representative government is only made possible through stringent adherence to its transparency laws and policies, Neither the dual-chamber Democrat majority nor Governor Sisolak saw any urgency in opening the building to the public, notwithstanding the F. Until I stopped talking. So I was recording. <laughs> so let me see. I don't think it did this one. In February 2021, Nevada policy made headlines by publishing a report detailing the myriad ways in which Governor Sisolak had to that point, abused the emergency powers supposedly granted to him by NRS 414. The relevant provisions of NRS 414 declare, in part, because of the existing and increasing possibility of the occurrence of emergencies or disasters of unprecedented size and destructiveness resulting from enemy attack, sabotage or other hostile action, from a fire, flood, earthquake, storm or other natural causes, or from technological or man-made catastrophes, and in order to ensure that the preparations of this state will be adequate to deal with such emergencies or disasters, and generally to provide for the common defense and to protect the public welfare, 
and to preserve the lives and property of the people of the state, it is hereby found and declared to be necessary a. To create a state agency for emergency management and to authorize the creation of local organizations for emergency management in the political subdivisions of the state. b. To confer upon the governor and upon the executive heads or governing bodies of the political subdivisions of the state the emergency powers provided in this chapter. c. To assist with the rendering of mutual aid among the political subdivisions of the state and with other states and to cooperate with the federal government with respect to carrying out the functions of emergency management. 2. It is further declared to be the purpose of this chapter and the policy of the state that all functions of emergency management in this state be coordinated to the maximum extent with the comparable functions of the federal government, including its various departments and agencies of other states and localities and of private agencies of every type, providing for the most effective preparation and use of the nation's workforce resources and facilities for dealing with any emergency or disaster that may occur. Nevada Policies Robert Fellner, author of the report, held no punches when describing the ways Governor Sisolak has misled the public and abused his emergency authority under NRS 414. One example includes the governor's false claim in Executive Order No. 35 that NRS 414.060 grants him the power to direct and control the movement of the general public. The actual text of the statute grants no such power to the governor, but instead merely states that the governor may cooperate with federal or state officials on emergency management issues affecting both the state and nation. A statute that merely authorized the governor to cooperate with other state and federal government agencies during an emergency does not permit Governor Sisolak to control the conduct of private citizens in their own homes, Nevada Policy Vice President Robert Fellner said. When read in their full context, it is clear that the emergency powers statutes are confined to those emergencies in which immediate action is required, such as military attacks from a foreign entity natural disasters, and so forth. Needing to cooperate with the president or neighboring states about how to direct traffic and the movement of the general public makes sense during the kinds of emergencies contemplated by the act, such as a missile attack or catastrophic natural disaster of some sort, Fellner said.
don't even know where it stops. At the end of the paragraph, I wasn't gone that long. Here we go. The increasing influence of organized labor, particularly public sector unions, throughout every facet of Nevada's legislative process was again apparent during the 2021 session. As a general rule, legislation which was vehemently supported by labor unions, both public and private, succeeded, while bills fiercely opposed by labor unions were wholly ignored by the Democrat majority. The dominance of organized labor in the policymaking process is rooted in two truths. Nevada's laws overwhelmingly differ to the interests of organized labor, and labor unions have long been among Democrats' largest donors. As such, Democrats realize that a nay vote on any union-prioritized legislation will likely draw a primary challenge in the next cycle. The influence, or outright hegemony, more accurately, is so great, in fact, that multiple bills with overwhelming public support were outright ignored by the Democrat majority from day one of the legislative session through sign die on day 120. Perhaps most frustrating about unions' influence in killing legislation they oppose is, more often than not, unions' interests do not align with those of the taxpayer's government is ostensibly designed to serve. Reflecting this, most of the crucial reforms to bolster the quality of education provided in Nevada, opposed vigorously by teacher unions, in particular, never saw the light of day in committee. Nevada's K-12 education establishment has, for years, fulminated about its perceived lack of funding to justify its miserable student performance metrics. Needless to say, this ignores the entirety of evidence which indicates quite convincingly, that per-pupil spending is a rather worthless indicator of student achievement, with many comparable states, such as Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, and then Florida ranking higher in academic performance. Indeed, as the adjacent scatter plot makes clear, per-pupil spending correlates weakly with student performance. Nevada policy, of course, is fluent in this research and understands the dynamics at play. Simply spending more money is no guarantee of improved student learning. Other factors beyond per-pupil spending, such as accountability reforms, performance-based evaluations and educational choice programs, have been empirically proven to increase academic performance, as well as boost other important measures such as college enrollment, civic engagement and parental and student satisfaction. Acknowledging this reality is paramount to improving the quality of education offered within the Silver State. As demonstrated by the chart below, generated by the Cato Institute, Continuing to increase K-12 funding, without structural reform, will not markedly improve student achievement. Did you understand that? I mean, the real deal is, is that student achievement is based on foundational services. And we don't have an understanding as to just, you know, self to share. As to just the responsibility of self self-responsibility just to ensure that kids are passing kids are are you know benefiting because it's mandatory so oh, it's just saying that my live meeting is going live let me see let me see if i can just get in here i'm in, i'm in here already it's me i don't have to do anything else because it's me 